Fabry. But let me start by introducing Zachary. Um, Zachary Fabry is an interdisciplinary artist engaged in lens-based media, language systems, and public space, often complicating the boundaries of studio research and social practice. The context specificity often yields work that includes design, drawing, photography, video, and installation. Fabry's awards include the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award, the Franklin Furness Fund for Performance Art, the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship, and the Brick Colleen Brown Art Prize. Fabry's work has been exhibited at Art in General, the Studio Museum in Harlem, El Museo del Barrio, the Walker Art Center, the Brooklyn Museum, the Barnes Foundation, and Performer. He has collaborated on projects at the Museum of Modern Art, the Charger Biennial, and Pace Gallery. In 2021, he exhibited at the Ludwig Museum in Budapest, Hungary, and completed a solo project at Recess Art in Brooklyn, New York. Fabry lives and works in Brooklyn. Zachary, I want to thank you for joining us today. We got off to a really like kind of like interesting start here. I thought we were like being like, you know, Zoom bombed there, which has happened before. So thankfully, that's not what was happening today. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm happy to be here in conversation with you. Um, and yeah, just want to say thanks for inviting me. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. So a little bit of uh, full disclosure here. Um, not that anyone really cares, but I'm not in my normal setup here. So the light might look a little bit weird. You might also hear my dog in the background, which is sort of like unusual because my dog hasn't been around for a while. So just please bear with me. <laughs> Hopefully I won't get too distracted. Um, Zachary, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the kind of work that you do. And for an artist of, of, of like you, that's kind of like a complicated question. I have often been asked by people like, okay, so I've heard of Zachary Faber. Can you tell me about the work that he makes? And I find myself kind of going, hmm, where do I begin? <laughs> so, so where do you begin? That's a wonderful question, actually. That is um, the essential kind of like party elevator pitch, um, but also like, condensing your artist's statement into like a, a, a phrase. And I mean, actually I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Um, and the word that kind of keeps coming back and that sticks with me is material or materiality maybe. Um, and I think that's the, the kind of material investigation, I think is where is at the root of my practice. Um, and I think, so, you know, as you've uh, very nicely kind of stated in my artist statement, often my practice is lens-based, which is either, I'm on either side of the lens, um, either capturing photos and videos or positioning my body in front of the camera. Um, and, uh, and, but I think I see that as a, photography and performance or the body, that's all that's the material to be exploited, I think. Um, and I think as my practice has kind of awful, also expanded um, to include drawing and objects and other forms, I think material is the way that I can understand my practice. It's like, I don't, I never say that I'm gonna go make a drawing, you know? Cause I, I tried that and I failed horribly. Um, and so instead of making a drawing, I kind of think about, well, what material am I interested in right now? And sometimes that material is like, like little, li literally the earth from the clay on the ground that you walk, um, or it's wood, it, it could be ebony wood or magnetic audio tape, and, um, or it could be acrylic, you know? So I think, I, I think through material first, and I think like, how do I execute my concepts? What is the best like process for me to engage in material to, to get to where I wanna to get to? And I mean, so I said a bunch there, but just if I could concisely repeat that, I think, I think, I think through material, uh, and the next is a process to execute a concept. Thank you. Um, one of the words you mentioned more than once was, was body, right? And uh, 
part of the reason I was very interested in having this conversation with you in the context of New York Academy of Art, you know, as a as a as a school that focuses a, a lot of attention on the figure. And, uh, and when I think of your work, one of the things that I often, you know, think about is how you use your body in your work. It seems to me um, one of the more like recurring aspects of your work. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that because I've seen you put your body through some intense physical paces mm -hmm. for your work. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great place to start. Um, and, uh, It's, I, I, you know, I guess it's, it's a, it's the most human, um, the, the thing that human relate to, the, the thing that humans relate to the most is our understanding of the body. Um, and they can easily enter anyone's artwork uh, if there's any semblance or narrative around the body. And so I wasn't, strategically thinking about creating my work using the body in terms of that way. It was just more like, what do I have access to? And, uh, and then what are my abilities and skill sets? Um, so I have access to my own body and I know uh, that I can push myself and position myself in situations that I can't ask for of, of other people, you know? And so I know that I, can do that. Um, and that's my research is like, literally kind of like contextualizing my body in different environments, whether political um, or architectural. Um, and it's been a way to kind of deepen my research is to think about the body um, in every sense of the, the way. I mean, in earlier in grad school, it was more about the black political body um, as it relates to the camera lens. And I was thinking about uh, the, his the, the history of performance, the history of the black body performing um, in the contents, con context of a, of a white lens. Um, and so that became something to critique, um, something to kind of make more complicated and to maybe own. Um, and that was a kind of a starting point of like, how can I interrogate these spaces that are highly political and oppressed? Um, and how can I maybe open them up um, to a place of complexity and maybe abstraction with the body? Yeah, and I, I mean, that kind of, describes a bunch of different videos that I made. I, I like what you said about this idea that when, you know, you could ask someone else to perform these acts, but you know that these may not be things that you wanna ask someone else to do, but it's something you know that you can do. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, so I think it was something kind of like you, I stumbled on, you know, I stumbled into. I mean, I was just kind of like doing things, uh, experimenting. Um, and after a while, I think getting feedback, critical feedback um, from whether it's professors or peers, or curators or what have you, the, my understanding shifted from me, like it was like my understanding shifted about like uh, the the how do I say it the the attention to the attention to um, safety maybe and comfort or discomfort or danger um, and I mean there, there are things that like for example a director, film director, cannot ask of an actor, um, no matter how much money they're being paid, right? Um, and not that I'm a film director um, or an actor, but in many ways in my practice, I'm often both. And so, uh, so I could, 
conceive of a scenario or an idea that I'm interested in attacking or critiquing. And it, I kind of like, you just kind of have to do it yourself because even if you describe the situation, you go into detail about what you are looking for, what are you going after as an artist? And then you're asking this participant or this collaborator to execute that. Um, there's only gonna be so, they're only gonna go so far Hmm. before they sense this there's a certain level of risk that they just don't want to cross right or i mean so whether it's risk awkwardness uh shame uh many different uh situations in which they just don't want to place themselves in but i, I don't i don't know if it's a skill set or a disorder <laughs> But I'm 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 able to kind of weather that situation and push myself further to kind of follow that through. So in terms of risk or safety, I can kind of go a little bit further than what I want to ask a participant or a collaborator. Um, right, right. And also I think this also a matter of like having a clear vision of what you want. The outcome, yes. and you you mentioned that, and and certainly yeah. to try to, for lack of a better word, direct someone to that end is much more difficult in many ways than to execute it yourself. Yeah, and um, and I'll add just just to follow up a little bit. Um, a lot of times these things are kind of really born out of my um, daily life too, and so sometimes they're quite um, personal um, to me and my experiences, and I think that's another way in which I want to. Sometimes I don't want the work to be autobiographical, but in some ways I'm interested in kind of like uh, focusing on that personal space and like looking for content um, in my own experiences. And I think that's for me just a lot easier to kind of like execute in that way. Thank you. Well. You know, the good news is that we have a lot of images of your work that we can share. And I want to get into that because I have some questions about, you know, certain works that you've created over the years. And and also for everyone that's joining us today, you know, it's sort of interesting. I think that the first time I began um, working with Zach on anything was in 2009, I believe. Um, so that would that would be, you know, 13 years ago, um, believe it or not. It's quite, quite amazing. Uh, so, so here we are. A lot has happened um, in in thirteen years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. I mean, that's I when I was putting the slides together. Um, I went down that history, you know, like I kind of like, and I didn't, you know, like when you're going through your resume, you're going through looking for old, you know, new and recent works. I didn't know how far back I wanted to go, but I did want to kind of honor our this kind of like professional relationship. And one of the, one of the earliest curatorial um, works that you that you created was this video um, mm -hmm. at Makata. Um, yeah, yeah. And that was that, that show opened in 2010 and we started talking about it in 09. So yeah, there yeah. you are, you know, time flies. So yeah. you can share your screen when you're ready and we can we can go through um, go through images. Sure. All right. So yeah, I know you have. I know that you have it on autoplay, but um, maybe what we will do. So, you know, if if you feel like the cadence is is okay with you, then fine. But if you you want to pause and slow it down, that's also fine. Okay. So I'll um, I'll just pause it here, um, okay. and then I'll go back a little bit. Okay. Actually, the controls. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just to note that this is kind of the earliest kind of formative work in terms of the body that I made in 2005. 
and that was at um, in grad school. And I put this here because it it's, it utilizes you know, my body performance in front of a live audience, but also this material of um, silk. Um, and this is a performance in um, Iceland, Reykjavik, Iceland. Again, maybe the second performance that I've already had made, but I put it in here because it was something that was the next level in terms of like performing on the inside, taking it to an urban exterior place. And again, uh, manipulating these two materials, Coca-Cola and white flour. And this is the this is the work that I um, that we spoke of in terms of. Uh, so if you are, if you're advancing, I'm not seeing it on the screen. Oh, you're not. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. I think you may have to stop and then share again. Zoom is like that sometimes. It's not even your computer. Sometimes uh, it has this weird thing where yes. um, you you have to just kind of start the process over over again. Of course, of course. Thank you for that. And, and uh, I see that we have a couple of questions coming in in the meantime. So just want to let folks know if you're asking questions, they will be answered. All right. So I'm going to. Uh, and if it, if, yeah, that's better. And if it's helpful, Zach, um, you could also, if, if the autoplay is creating problems, you could just, you know, manually go through it. It's okay if we see the thumbnails on the side. All right. That's, I think that's a, uh, something that I'm, I'm going to do then is that the zoom and the keynote for some reason they're not talking they're not communicating the best that happens so, sometimes switch this back save that and if that doesn't work i have the presentation as well and i can share my screen so we'll give you one more shot <laughs> right right okay i think i think we got it though okay so we're on manual controls now um so, yeah, again, uh, it's a little not clear. It's a little unclear. Now it's starting to kind of like come into focus or not. I tell you what, let me do it from my side. Sorry, folks. Okay. You know, Zoom happens to act that way sometimes, but let me share my screen and then you can just tell me when to advance. Okay, no problem. How about that? So you can stop your share. I'll start my share. All right. I'm here for you. God, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. Can you see my screen? I can. Great. So you can just tell me when you want me to advance. Um, yeah, you can advance. Um, I think we're just talking, I'm talking about the, um, the body in relationship to an indoor environment and then the body in relationship to an exterior environment, environment an outside urban environment, um, but also focus on materials where there's the silk thread, thread or um, the very messy Coca-Cola and white flour. Um, and could I, could I um, pause you for a moment? So um, I, I, I wanna just uh, be a little bit more descriptive on some of, these, um, some of these stills because this is a still from a video. And if you could just take a moment to explain um, these three slides here are part of the same video. So maybe you could just talk us through very briefly, what are we seeing here? Yeah, um, um, this is a, I think um, I would call it one of my, like probably my first performance. Um, and I was invited to create a performance in my friend's exhibition space, which was a clothing boutique. Uh, and her work was a, a hoodie um, that she designed. And it was the hoodie, was the, the design of the Reykjavik National Bird, um, a puffin bird, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, her name is Olga, um, and she's a wonderful artist, actually. She's coming to New York City for ISCP, um, I think, uh, very soon. So when I arrived in, in Reykjavik and I went to the clothing store, it was just the environment of a clothing store, a retail store, did not inspire uh, me to kind of create something. So immediately I said, I want to do something outside. And um, I was thinking about how do I, how do I make this performance somehow uh, have local re resonance? 
Um, you know, I did a, some superficial research in terms of like Iceland and Reykjavik in particular. And, and I found out that they were one of the number one consumers of Coca-Cola. Um, and that was enough for me, for my brain to kind of go to like, okay, um, Coca-Cola, body, diet, um, and then the relationship of, the, of, the, of your psychology to the physical body. Um, and so this performance basically is a, it's, I think it's a absurd and abstract uh, series of rituals that this particular character, myself, goes through at different parts of this street. Um, and as this character kind of engages with Coca-Cola and flour, um, you see the intensity um, uh, increase. Um, and there was no clear narrative to the performances. My performances are not about narrative, they're not about um, uh, a simple structure, but they're more about image making and a feeling that I want to communicate. Um, Thank you. I want to, I'm going to advance to this next um, series of, of stills. So this, I think, is part of one two, three, four. Yeah. And maybe we can talk a bit about these works. Yeah, yeah, this, so I, I put these, I put this right after that performance because um, again, like my research was, was around the body, the black body movement, um, uh, and how, how external factors influence um, the way people move and carry themselves um, and in a very wide space. So um, uh, this was in 125th Street in Harlem, New York. Um, I was living in Harlem for about nine years. And um, at, at this point, I moved away from Harlem to Bed-Stuy. Uh, and uh, no, that's not correct. I was still living in Harlem, sorry. I was still living in Harlem and I would go and do, I, would, I was working as a graphic designer and I, was, I would take these walks, take these breaks and I'd go and sit in front of um, Adam Peyton Powell Plaza and these concrete benches. And then which is, which is also directly in front of the Studio Museum of Harlem, which is behind the scaffolding um, in the back. And but then there's also this kind of a kiosk, this um, uh, Afrocentric um, band that sells magnet, magnet stickers, CDs, bean pies, and flags. Um, and so there was a, a confluence of a lot of amazing uh, like things, like energies, uh, people, and economies. Um, and all of them were, were Black, you know? And so I just love this complexity of, of blackness. Um, and, uh, and so quite, I mean, I, as a, as a person who's, who's interested in making videos and moving images, I always had my trusty point and shoot camera in my pocket, um, which back then was like, I think HD. Um, so these two guys, what you, what you see with the white shirt and black pants, it was not clear but they were basically hired by this van, this kiosk station to kind of promote and create this energy so that people could buy the wares and the merchandise from this little kiosk, from that van. But it wasn't very clear. It just seemed like these were street dancers um, or folks just out there. And so um, I was really interested in this particular slide here in which you see buy black on this van in the background, really small, under the blue the blue umbrella. Right. And that was enough for me uh, to basically create this kind of word poetry type um, slippage that goes across the video. And these are still images from a video, um, right. just so people understand. Um, right. And the, the two guys who are in the video are doing body movements that go from uh, seemingly painful to comical. There's a large spectrum of body movements. Um, 
And then as I kind of created this text that goes on top of it, the text speaks, I think, directly to the gentrification that was happening in Harlem in a very particular way at that time. And, and I'm glad you mentioned text, and I'm glad that this next slide um, appears here. It probably takes a moment for my computer to process, clear it up. There you go. There um, the next slide appears here um, because text is such a huge part of your work. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I see you, you know, sort of coming back to some of, to, to some of this um, yeah. in more recent works. Um, so let, let's, let's spend some time on these three slides here. I'm going to go through them. Um, I hope that our faces are not obscuring the ability to read these slides, but I'm just going to move this down here just in case. Um, and then I'll go to the next one. The next one might be difficult to see because of the, the way the colors kind of vibrate. I can uh, see it though. Another, um, also the processing on this, it takes like a moment for it to get sharp. Yeah. Um, but as that process is, um, so I'll just kind of speak to the relationship of that video to these text pieces. And there's, it's a very direct relationship in which I made that video and it's a, that's the one work, probably two works in my entire career, I've gotten a lot of feedback on. And one of them is overwhelmingly joyous um, and uh, um, like beautiful feedback and um, positive feedback in the most beautiful way. And that was like this piece and with the balloons and the dreadlocks and everything. Um, but the other part that has the most feedback is this video that we were just looking at those slides. And I get, I, at that point it was like, because it's a very kind of complex video and I think it stirs and pokes at certain things that people don't really want to see or aren't aren't ready to maybe watch in a way, right? Um, and so that kind of like was a, was a lot for me, you know, um, as an artist, as someone who made something and who's responding, I'm like responding to someone respond to my work, right? Um, as all artists do, you put something out there and people are gonna respond to it. And so not that the video was a negative piece or a dark piece, but it just had a certain weight to it in a way that I felt didn't, didn't speak to the, um, how progressive, let's say, uh, what by black meant. Um, mm. And so I started thinking about by black because that was the kind of like the, the nut of that video. Um, and then the more I researched by black, which historically is about buying, um, buying from like black owned businesses, right? Um, and so the more I researched that, the more I was delving into black nationalism, mm. right? historical black nationalism, I like to say. Um, and buying, buying black is like, let's say one of the tenets of that maybe. And the more I research black nationalism, you know, uh, you hit upon Marcus Garvey as like one of the forefathers or kind of one of the most, he kind of popularized it in, in a way. Um, but all of these kind of text pieces come from a wealth of scholarship and, and uh, research by African Americans, Africans, Black folks, prior to Marcus Garvey, hundreds of years before Garvey, who were doing this kind of uh, work and scholarship about uh, the advancement of, of Black folks, uh, about how do we, how do we get to the next level, um, quite simply. And uh, so these works are meant to be these kind of, uh, these uh, holders or markers or um, posters or these kind of squares that, that locate us in a history that is not only branded by trauma. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm particularly struck by, um, the the way that these works feel very much like uh contemporary advertising right mm. there's, there's a and we talked about that some years ago because yeah. we you know I, I had the uh, honor of uh displaying some works from this series at Al Jaira back in 2016 on the exterior of the building and 
you know, what was interesting to me is that it blended perfectly into the vocabulary of urban advertising mm -hmm. until you actually read the words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, per it's like spot on. I mean, and this was, um, so the, like how these were made, like why they look the way they do is I was thinking about just that. I was like, thinking about black nationalism and how, like, who knows about it? How many people know about it? Um, and is it relevant today? Like, and this was, again, when I first thought about these were like 2009, 2010. And I was like, and this was of course, like let's say two years after Obama was elected, right? And so we're all in this kind of sweet, spot kumbaya spot about like oh we win race is over kind of thing right um let's have a beer so to speak um but i was thinking like no like work i i was thinking like okay sure we win we, we want a battle right but um much work has to be done you know so how do we really continue to do to do that work and so um so i was thinking like okay black nationalism and i'm a graphic designer by have my bachelor's degree, spent last 20 years off and on in different design jobs, salaried and freelance and what have you. Um, and so I was like, all I'm, like when I go out into the world, I see branding and I see strategies on branding. And uh, I was looking just, I think through a magazine or something. And I was looking at uh, this American apparel, this one company that I think they're, they've gone under, they're, they're just, uh, what do you call it? They, yeah, yeah, bank, bankrupt or whatever. Uh -huh. But they, you know, they, they. I think they're a horrible company in terms of like how they exploited young women and young women's bodies in terms of their branding, and uh, and I think that's what kind of struck me was the relationship between body um, and text and politic mm -hmm. and this desire for object or product. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like steal their branding. Basically, I'm gonna like <laughs> borrow certain aspects of their branding, which is Helvetica bold, uh, justified right, justified left, you know, tightly kerned, tightly leaded with hyper colors that are hard to read. And mm. I was thinking, I was like, well, if they can brand like hoodies and uh, gym socks with um, underage girls' bodies and do it successfully with this kind of branding, um, I'm not going to use the bodies, but then can I brand black nationalism, you know, mm. is it possible to, to brand an ideology? That was my question. Well, uh, I'd say the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's, there's ample evidence that the answer is yes. yes. Uh, let's, let's advance to, to this uh, body of work here that I also had the experience of seeing the video, um, you know, uh, in person and these objects that are associated with it. So you can begin describing it and I'll just show some of the images. Sure, sure, sure. And so, you know, by now you get, you've gotten a sense where, okay, you, as my practice, um, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm using different strategies and different materials to execute different concepts. And um, this is a project in which I brought like two cameras and tripods to a residency in Brazil in Belo Horizonte in a small town called um, Jardim Canada, small neighborhood rural town where the residency resided. And, um, you know, like I got there with all these cameras and stuff and that's just what I do. Um, but then I was just thinking, I was like, you know what? I don't wanna, I don't wanna shoot any video. like. I want to make work that's not video based, that's not lens based, and that was my rule. That was my problem. That I that was my restraint that I put on myself, right? And um, I like to say that my a lot a large part of my practice is about structure and restraint, and so that was the restraint and structure for this body of work. And so I was thinking about what is a camera and and how do I you know, because prior to this, I was making all these videos in which I positioned myself in front of the camera. So with this work, I was like, okay, well, this, what am I doing here in Brazil? And I started walking around 
And I think the first day I walked around, I came back and all my clothes were, were orange because they're, all of the roads were not paved. And I was like, well, that's it. That's it. Like literally I'm a walking video camera. And so the clothes that I came with, literally the shirt and the pants I came with, I took them to a local tailor. And I was like, can you reproduce these clothes in cotton linen? And went out and bought some white shoes, um, which are not especially good for walking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I wanted them to be these kind of like uh, samba dancing shoes in some way, um, mm. like the, the wrong shoes for walking in dirt. Um, right. uh, and so I was like, okay, this is it. I went out on my first day with this pristine white like um, clothing and it became my recording equipment. It became the, the analog uh, recording equipment that would record the data of this material. And the, what this dirt is, it's, um, it's a mine for iron ore. There's a huge uh, mine across the street from the residency. Um, and that was like, that was kind of part of the kind of like conceptual narrative about mining. Um, and then the video became about like, is it possible to reverse mine uh, something. Can you put back natural resources inside the earth? And so in the video, there's a, a reversal, which looks like I'm taking minerals from the, from the air and putting them back into to the earth. And so, the, the big, so what started as um, a simple walk um, in my environment ended up solving my problem in terms of like, what am I going to do? What are my materials? And what is the actual work about? What is the narrative, the conceptual narrative? And it became this um, accidental um, work about environmentalism. And there are these other objects that emerge from this, this residency. So these were works on paper that were also part of, uh, you know, your use of that material. Yes, yes. And thank you for reminding me of that. So um, in addition to the, this kind of clothing suit, um, I was still interested in kind of maybe expanding um, the relationship with, between the body and the earth. And so we're wanting to maybe tighten the connection in people's minds between the earth and someone's physical bodies. Um, because I feel like we don't really think about uh, that connection so much until we die, right? There's a very direct connection between the earth and the physical body when you die. But, but prior to that, uh, only kids are privy to making, playing in, in the mud, playing in the dirt. Um, so this project basically, I like, I stripped myself naked, um, brought a, bu a bunch of the, this uh, earth from the outside, and I just rubbed it on different parts of my body. And then I rubbed my body on different um, parts of the paper. So this is a shoulder and arm, and this particular one is chest. This is a butt, and you can see the buttocks imprint. And this one is, uh, again, another uh, component to the project in which I created a journal. So I was there for two months. And I was, I, like I said earlier in our talk, like, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to make a drawing. Um, but if I set out to say I'm going to make a drawing, I'm going to fail. So what I end up doing is making some larger apparatus with, so within that, I can kind of build in these kind of systems to make drawings. And this was a journal of sorts where I would just pick up rocks from the street and make these marks in this book. So the book is just filled with these kind of mark making pages. So we have um, these two images that I think are installation shots. Um, yes. Is this art in general? Yes, it is. It is. That is the former location of Art in General um, when they were in Soho, um, I believe on Walker Street, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. And, um, and, I, and I, put, I put this in here because it's, number one, it's, it allows you to see how I kind of move between odd projects in my practice. Because um, I don't really work in a very linear way. And unfortunately, I'm having to, you know, uh, manage different projects and uh, work on the opportunities, work on them as opportunities come. And so, uh, so this was, again, 
a maybe the first iteration of these text pieces in a public in a, a more a public facing way and um and the curator there christine chapel was really interested in this idea of 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 how might this storefront be branded differently like art in general but as someone walks by she felt like there was like a kind of outward branding from text that mm. she was interested in and this was the installation at al Jaira to sort of see another way that these works can kind of live uh in the public space yes um, no, exactly. i particularly love this image <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no exactly and and this one was i think um really uh fun for me because it allowed me to so if if art in general was hanging behind the glass and it was on Sintra printed there were uh digital prints on Sintra with this with this like, plastic material and it was hanging behind the glass this is printed directly on vinyl material which is then installed on right on the glass and so there's a more immediate physical kind of imprinting on the institution um, which I liked. And then this is something quite different um, that you can yeah. please, please speak about. Yeah, and so, you know, I think, uh, I think I was maybe like interested in the vinyl material and, but then also continually continuing to think through what is black data or what it, like if all these were black nationalist texts, right, that I was working with, these colorful black nationalist texts, I think I was just kind of interested in kind of distilling everything into uh, this raw black vinyl and abstracting it and slapping it on, literally sticking it on the wall as this kind of like um, ever like changing abstract shape. Um, and the title of this piece is, um, it's called Untitled Black Vinyl. And so I was, interested in the relationship of like this kind of this veneer this kind of superficial covering um and maybe my thinking of interiority you know mm. of like like is is blackness um sometimes a veneer uh, a superficial veneer um but is it is there a deeper interiority underneath this this covering if you could speak briefly about this body of work here which is actually one of the works that you've made that i think i think about very very often um i would love that yeah yeah no and i and i only put this uh one image in here because it kind of it kind of points at three different um gestures or three different works um, but yeah, this is a series of, of black presidents that um, that I worked on. Yeah, shortly after Obama was elected, um, I think I started working on that maybe in 2011. But it's um, not just black presidents. You have to put it oh, in the context. Oh yes, yes. So I mean, so they're, they're none of them are actually the president. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Except they are on film and TV. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so each one of these figures is a black president in a television show or a film. For example, the top, I'm going to say, like, I'm just going to say one of them is Chris Rock. And another one is Danny Glover. Another one is Dave Chappelle. Another one is Dennis Haysbert. Another one is Morgan, Morgan Freeman, um, Richard Pryor. Um, uh, and then, uh, there's, a, there's more, but I'm just gonna say one of the most interesting ones or complex is Sammy Davis Jr., this young child in the lower left side. Here, yeah. And that the name of that short film is called Rufus Jones for President. And if I remember the date, I think it's like 1920 or something like that. And he's a small child, literally probably 10 years old, a, a prodigy of, of of singing and moving his body in, in all kinds of ways. But it's such a it's such a, a weird, horrible film because they it's a farce. They only elect him as a farce. And so they're allowing him to be president 
they make this movie about a child, black child becoming president because they see that as comical. They see that as comedy. They're like, oh, wouldn't it be a hoot if we elected a black child as a president? And so that's literally how the film is presented as this farce. Um, and so these, the, the work that I made was kind of following this, um, this kind of mimetic mm. series of, uh, well, okay, Obama's the president. And then we know there's a few other black presidents filming TV. And then I was like, well, how many are there? You know, and then, then it's like, okay, so prior to Obama, it's like, well, we, we were given the right and the, this option to be president, but only in fiction, right? So, um, so in fiction and sci-fi and in comedy, um, we were allowed to kind of have this political agency. Well, what's, what's interesting about that um, is that this, this, uh, this guy right here uh, on the lower uh, right side, uh, Tiny Lister? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I, I'm going gonna... to... But he was actually the president of the world. <laughs> yes, he was the president of the world in the fifth element. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, so don't get it, don't get it twisted. He wasn't just a president of the United States. He was the president of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that's again, it just goes into new levels of, of, of absurdity. <laughs> so, in the interest of time, we're going to blow through the the next ones really quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then I and then I have a couple of uh, other questions, and I know that there were a couple of questions in the chat. So sure, we're going to sure. move through the remaining images rather rapidly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so I went to um, uh, an experimental projects residency in Alfred, New York, and this was 2020. So now we're in the pandemic, full, like fully in the pandemic. And so, you know, what better place to be when you're in a pandemic than in a stream upstate New York. And so I was, you know, you know, very concisely, it was just experimenting with recording equipment, my environment, and um, how to make things again. Like, what is my process of making things? And so what is process and what am I interested in? Like, this is a drawing, right? But it's a drawing I made with these river rocks and the river rocks were kind of like dipped into like charcoal. Um, and then I basically made them by moving my feet around the paper. Um, if you go to like the third next and then the one after, that's just a, Kind of production shot right and so you know quite simply it's like not about me moving my body but how can i move my body to make a mark or a gesture and uh shortly after that this is a uh residency um that i took part of in 2021 and the work that i made here i really you know the, I really enjoyed this process because they allowed me to kind of just geek out and to be, go into my Zach brain and be as Zach as I want to be, whatever that means. Um, but so the work that I proposed was I was going to make research for a film that I was going to make. And so phase one is making research. And I was like, well, what is research? I'm going to make drawings as my research. So I'm always trying to make drawings. Um, and so the end goal is a film, but I need to kind of like, you know, get into, and so I was also thinking like, research is not just academic papers on JSTOR or Google search or, or, the, or the physical library, but research is actually a making, a making uh, space. And so what I call drawings are these kind of collections of objects um, and their relationships to, to themselves and history and time. And so this is a, a picture frame that the picture was removed by by water damage um and so i i just quite like that um and this is a, a drawing that i made um with white denim um and uh activated charcoal actually and then dear sister is uh hand drawn with a uh, pencil um the slide beneath that is charcoal with white denim imprinted on the paper and the wall. Um, and again, like I said, these are drawings that were not necessarily, and then, so the question I asked myself at the end of this residency was, can one present research 
in an exhibition space, you know? So research is not meant to be finished and refined, um, but what does it look like when you present research? And so that allowed me to kind of just have, have lower, lower stakes and be in a more experimental space. Um, this, I uh, finished this in December. Uh, speaking of process and experimental um, spaces, Recess is a wonderful art space um, that allows artists to directly engage with the audience. And so um, my project, and Dexter was is familiar with this project in 2016, was having conversations with Black people um, and recording those conversations on analog audio tape, which that audio tape is wound around an ebony wooden frame. And that ebony wooden frame is that becomes the holder of the archive of that data. And so there's no digital evidence of that conversation. Um, at, uh, happening concurrently with Recess was a, a show in Budapest that I was part of. It was a group show, but I, I was able to have my own kind of little small gallery space. Um, and I included this because it does point with, it points to the text on these, on the windows. And the text is reversed um, because I wanted people who are down on the streets to read the text. And of course, when you're in the space, you can read it as well. So the text is in Hungarian. Um, and uh, an another, another lecture would be what that text means. <laughs> um, exactly, exactly. And so this is from ISCP. Yes, so I, I literally just moved out of that studio space about a month ago and was working on more of these, um, these text pieces, but now I've shifted to, this text being on canvas. And uh, so as you've seen the kind of the long journey of this, of this uh, text work, now I'm thinking about them quite simply as uh, the black nationalist text references, right? But how do they navigate the art space? And so I'm thinking about the kind of the regal power that painting holds in the academy, in the, in the market, um, in the canon. And so then how can black nationalism uh, physically navigate and maybe even interrupt a, um, a white art canon? And so this, this last series here, um, these are all stills from the same film. Yes. Memory foam. Yes. So this will be the last, um, work samples we'll talk about and then we'll get to the questions that are in the chat so we'll yes. we'll end here with these yeah and i end here um quite simply because it's literally the last thing that i'm doing currently right now that shows up at the q art foundation until may the middle of may um and the show consists of a this film uh which is called morning stutter and a new sculpture made out of memory foam photographs and a, a silk text piece. Um, and the show, quite simply, is about, um, about memory and about police violence and police uh, oppression in public space. Um, and so uh, Morning Stutter, which is the title of the film, addresses uh, the fact that there, there was a, there's so much police violence on Black bodies that we're not able to kind of move, move through mourning process. It's, it's a stutter. Um, and so Memory Foam, the name of the exhibition, the title of the exhibition is a reference to the material Memory Foam um, and its properties of returning back to form. Once mm -hmm. a weight or has been, uh, pressed against it, it returns to form. And mm. so I like that material property because I liken that as a metaphor to all of us in the entire world as we undergo trauma, whether it's COVID or racial violence, like how do we return to form um, uh, like after trauma? Mm. And I think that is the kind of space where I'm thinking now. 
So we have uh, we have a couple of questions here that we have time for before we we unfortunately have to end today. So one of the questions was uh, you talked about um, using your own body and preferably not the participants. This person is curious about um, collaborations. They said, you know, uh, Muse for Tete a Tete, uh, which you did with Micheline Thomas. And it's so, so the question I'm trying to structure it in a way that make it clear. I think what they're basically saying is they'd love for you to talk about. Um, you know, so like using muses or not using muses, but I think you got it. I think you kind of got into that um, with your explanation. Um, and you can see that you can see the question in the chat as well. So if you want to, you know, take a quick read of it and let me know if there's something you'd like to, to say to address that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I like that's a deep cut with the tete a tete, Nicolene um, muse, in which which you did with me, I mean, a news, it's not, it's, it's a no, um, I'm not remembering uh, exactly how Muse was being positioned in relationship mm -hmm. to the, the Tete a Tete show, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think uh, I like that question actually, because it, um, it makes you think about uh, this the idea of a muse, um, historically speaking, in art practice. Um, right. But I, I feel like everything, like I feel like there's so much information, there's so much data that we are bombarded with or that we choose to kind of scroll through, um, whether your choice or not, uh, you walk around in the world. I think that this idea of muse is kind of interesting considering how much information we are absorbing. And right whether or not a muse historically speaking exists anymore um there's another there's another question here it says uh, you mentioned two distinct moments where you took elements from the earth and used it to make a statement or a point with the pieces you make but also said it was accidental is an organic is it an organic interest of yours using the natural elements or do you just find yourself being more scrappy and using what's around you or both um both so Let's say uh, what's around me was when I was in Brazil, and it was, um, I think a huge part of my practice is to literally look what to look look and see what it like what is around me as a material. And sometimes you don't have to look too far. Sometimes you can literally look ten feet and you'll see crap, but you can just how is how you use that crap, you know. So. When I was in Brazil, what was around me was this, this, um, this, this dirt, right? And I was like, I don't need to think beyond the dirt that's in my latte, that's in my laptop. And how do I think about this dirt? What is the kind of political, economic relationship with the dirt? Um, and then your, the other part of that question is um, more conceptually and more doing re more born out of research was thinking about materials like um like charcoal or or, or activated charcoal um which i'm doing research on now so there are things in which i just stumble upon when i go for a walk um but then there are some things that i really do crunch and dig and i chase this person also asked if there was a possibility of purchasing any of these um as prints i would just simply tell them to DM you and IG and just take it from there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> that, seems like the, that seems like the simplest way to do that. Yeah. Uh, yep. um, the other question here is, uh, I'd like to hear more about the relationship, um, sorry, would like to hear about the relation of material to the speculation on whether blackness is a veneer or a deeper interiority. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great that. question to end on, right? <laughs> When I, as I was saying that, I was like, oh yeah, no, that's a whole another, that's a whole nother talk. But it's, you know, it's, it's something that I'm really interested in, in terms of um, material research, like, like using materials to uh, point to something else. Um, and that, I think that research, that investigation with that material and those ideas, I'm nowhere near complete with that, um, with that thought, right? 
and it's it's a it's a fledgling thought um, and a, kind of like a gesture or an attempt to make some early work in which I, all that work is really early and it feels even now when I look back it feels fresh and early but I'm still interested in those ideas about about veneer and physical veneer but also let's say symbolic or uh or it's a veneer that's even maybe imprinted upon you mm. um, uh and but so the interiority i feel like is probably one of the larger themes of my work you know in terms of like i don't i don't think about it literally i don't think about blackness the interiority of blackness um but i think about how do I live my life in this world? Um, how do I live my life in this, my, my neighborhood in New York and the United States and when I travel? Um, and how do I live my life and the experiences that happen to me? Um, that's, that's kind of part of maybe that data collection of, of, of kind of like swimming through the interiority hmm. and and a lot of that is personal um but i think beyond the personal is where i kind of curious you know like artists are always curious to see if any of this lands if any of this anyone else um like how anyone else feels in relationship to the way i feel you know um and I think in quite simply, I think that's, that's the kind of way I make my work in a, in a very streamlined way. It's like, I try to be is in terms of interiority, but in terms of like really just, I don't know, um, who, like how I exist, who I am. Like I try to be as goofy as I can be, as wacky, as, as serious, as sensitive, um, as weird um, as I can be. Because then I feel like then that is that is when I, my work becomes my work. You know that that's when you are not looking at any, any other artists. You know, um, sure you can borrow. You know how people the different strategies and how different artists solve different problems. But I'm really interested in like, how can I maybe, okay, bringing it back to maybe this kind of superficial veneer, um, how can I maybe pull that back um, and reveal as much as I can of myself without being ashamed or afraid or, uh, uh, yeah, like not fitting in a uh, certain um, certain systems of identity. And so, yeah, I think that's kind of how, the way I've been thinking about my practice in general, but maybe as a relationship to that question. Well, um, that answer is why I wanted to talk to you today. <laughs> So exactly. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I want to thank New York Academy of Art for providing this platform for artists to talk about the work that they do and how that work exists in the world. And I want to thank everyone that joined us this evening. Of course, the recording will be available on New York Academy of Arts uh, YouTube channel, and I'm sure um, folks can find the links on their website as well. So I want to thank everyone. Wish everyone a great evening, Zachary. It's so good catching up with you. And uh, next time I'm back in New York, um, we got to get together, do a studio visit, have a beer, something. Be great to see you. Thanks again. Have a fantastic night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dexter. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.